on Radio EcoShock. The nuclear accident at Fukushima, Japan, is far from over. Three reactors continue to melt down, and now there is a storm of international worry about nuclear fuel ponds tottering in blown-up buildings. The whole northern hemisphere is at risk right now. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. We are joined again by nuclear industry expert Arnold Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. Arnie Gunderson, a year ago you warned us right here on Radio EcoShock and to anybody else who would listen that a world-scale catastrophe was lurking in the nuclear fuel storage ponds of both reactors 3 and 4 at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan. Why do you think this story is finally getting wider attention now, a year later? Well, I think, you know, the drama of seeing units explode and the talk of meltdown has finally subsided and... um, that allows what little press there is that's covering it to move on to what, what's in fact the, the much bigger story, and that's the, the condition of the fuel in Unit 4's fuel pool. And, and I'm glad you mentioned it in the lead in there that Unit 3's fuel pool uh, should also be a concern to policymakers. This Mark 1 design is so fragile, and everybody was focused on what's inside the containment. But we're at a point now where we really have to worry about what's outside the containment. Yeah, well, let me just read a couple things into the record here. The Japanese press, which has been following the government line up till now, is starting to break out. On April 2nd, Takao Yamada, expert senior writer for Manichi paper, said, quote, The seven-story building itself has suffered great damage, and with the storage pool barely intact on the building's third and fourth floors, the roof has been blown away. If the storage pool breaks and runs dry, the nuclear fuel inside will overheat and explode, causing a massive amount of radioactive substances to be spread over a wide area. And we also had the unusual case of Japan's former ambassador to Switzerland, Matsui Murata, speaking out at a public hearing of the Budgetary Committee on March 22, 2012, and he told the Swiss if Reactor 4 fuel pool collapses, the cooling water for all six reactors could be shut down, as well as for a nearby spent fuel pool with another 6,000 rods. And then finally, Arnie, we have Japanese diplomat Akio Matsumura. He's blogging about this publicly. It's very surprising Japanese officials are speaking out. Why now? Do they know something we don't? Well, I've been working with Takio Matsumura now for more than a year on this problem, and I have to give him a lot of credit. He has been persistent and single-focused on the issue of these fuel pools. But Gordon Edwards in Canada and I have been um, talking to Ambassador Matsumura frequently on the fuel pool issue. I'd like to think that the book we wrote has a little impact on this as well. They call it the kimono band. The colored band around the book in Japanese only says the quote that they lifted from the book is that if Unit 4 collapses, you're going to have to evacuate Tokyo. But but that's not news. It's a new book. But I think, you know, the combination of Ambassador Matsumura's work for a long time now, basically a year, that the book out there... And also, you know, what amazes me is the frequency of earthquakes in Japan it has been dramatically higher, actually leading up to the big 9.0. For about three or four months before that, there was a dramatic increase in the 4s and the 5s and the 6s in Japan. Something has shifted in the plates off of the coast of Japan. You know, my friends in Tokyo, and they're saying there's noticeably more significant tremblers in Tokyo than there were Oh, back in 2010. That combination is forcing people to realize that Fukushima is not going to go away anywhere anytime soon. Well, now, what, what is the book? Tell us about that. It's published by Shueisha. It's available in Japanese only on um, Amazon.jp. Maggie and I were interviewed by a woman journalist who then took that long interview, five, six days of interview, and put them in a book back in October which then got published in February, and I was in Japan speaking to the Japanese press club. But it's entitled Fukushima Daiichi, uh, The Truth and the Way Forward. I think it's important that the Japanese understand that there are alternatives to nuclear going forward that Tokyo Electric really doesn't want them to understand. 
And you raised this thing about more earthquakes, and I found some research in a paper. It's in a journal called Solid Earth. It's a journal of the European Geosciences Union, and it's by Da Peng Zhao, who is a geophysics professor at Japan's Tohoku University. And he says that the giant earthquake of March 2011 has reactivated a seismic fault closer to the Fukushima nuclear plant, and using the latest scientific techniques and measurements, this paper warns another big quake could strike even closer to the plant. And and one blog, Washington's blog, which is a pretty good blog, it says, scientists say there is a 70% chance of a magnitude 7 earthquake hitting Fukushima this year and a 98% chance within the next three years. And you said in an interview with Dr. Helen Caldicott back in February that if they got another 7 quake, that could do it. That could bring the reactor 4 fuel pool down. Yeah, I, I think we give ourselves as a species more credit than we deserve because we look back and and at the historical record, but really, you know, we've only been analyzing this for a hundred years and trying to go back in the historical record, perhaps a thousand. But you're stuck with the situation of a high consequence event that you believed has been low probability. But, you know, now we've got these papers saying that we've got a significant likelihood of serious earthquakes, and they're not low probability. So we've got the worst confluence. You know, you've got the, the high probability of rent combined with the high, the high seriousness. And uh, that's certainly a frightening place to be. And that's where Japan is right now. Well, it seems to me, and many Radio EcoShock listeners from all over the world have written me about this, that we're sleepwalking through a potential global catastrophe. And they want to know, why isn't there an international emergency action plan to save us from this? It's something that might make Chernobyl look small in comparison. Have you heard rumblings about that? What What are your thoughts? I have no information about any kind of a global concerted effort. You know, I, I know the Nuclear Regulatory Commission provides information But the way the world community is structured on nuclear reactors, there is no organization that pulls together a coordinated response. It might be a little different on nuclear bombs, but the nuclear reactors are very much seen as everybody's own domestic policy. You know, whether that's a developing country in the third world or a, a, a massive industrial country like Japan, it's basically been hands-off. Each country has the right to monitor and improve or, or disassemble their own reactors. I don't understand that because, as you just said, we are looking at the possibility of a global calamity. But the way the international law is structured and also, frankly, um, trying to get the interest of the State Department and the president is an incredibly difficult process. You know, they, they bounce along to the worst problem right now as opposed to really recognizing that there's a serious one just over the horizon. Well, we have social protests and actions on all sorts of things, even 9-11 and all sorts of things like that, but I'm not willing to just sit here and wait and see whether myself and my grandchild is, are, are irradiated to see whether the Japanese do something. I'm, I'm just not willing to wait for that. I, I agree with you, and, and you know I've been talking to as many government officials as I can, but I really haven't sensed that they have a fire lit on under them on this. I guess that's a bad analogy when we're talking about fuel pool fires, but I really don't sense that they have any uh, any burning desire to tackle the problem. You know, there, there's three ways you can tackle this problem. The first way is to gamble that the existing trolley is strong enough to put the spent fuel cask into the Unit 4 pool as it is. It seems like I think Japanese officials are considering that as an alternative. The problem is that that particular trolley is weakened by the explosions and the fire, and uh, if you were to try it, it may fail, in which case it would puncture the floor of, of, of the spent fuel pool. The last thing in the world you want is, as you're moving fuel, is to drop a spent fuel canister through that floor, because it will crack the floor, drain the pool, and cause the the worst imaginable accident, which um, Brookhaven has estimated that uh, tens of thousands of people will die from cancers as a result of a fuel pool fire. So you don't want to go there. It's kind of obvious. So the second way would be to use those smaller cranes they have on site and develop a special canister that maybe would only move two or three pieces of fuel at a time, 
but you got to get it off of that high floor and onto the ground. And the faster, the better. So that's sort of my proposed alternative. They already have another fuel storage spot on the site. So if you could get the fuel off that pool onto the ground and then into that other spent fuel storage pool, the problem is 95% mitigated. And the third alternative is to build the building around the building and then put a heavy-duty crane on that building and use that. But the problem there is that, you know, like you said, the chance of a severe earthquake are significant over the next year or two. If you want to gamble that it won't happen, the best thing to do would be to build a building around the building and put a crane in there. But given the consequences, I think the middle alternative, especially design a really small cask that can take out two or three bundles at a time and get them on the ground and then put them into the existing pool. Oh, I know the one you mean. It's got about 6,000 fuel rods in it right now. Uh, and time is of the essence. We really don't want to wait five or ten years to pull this off. And Unit 3, you know, you started the, the lead in on, on this whole piece by talking about Unit 3. Unit 3 is worse. It's mechanically, it's, a, it's rubble, the pool of rubble, and um, uh, it's got less fuel in it. But it faces the same problems. You know, structurally, the pool has been dramatically weakened, and God, nobody's even gotten near it yet. So um, we've got to get the fuel out of Unit 4 because that's where most of it is. And then you've got to move on to Unit 3 and pull the fuel from that pool just as quickly as you can. And you were an expert and, in fact, an, an executive in a company that dealt with fuel rod assemblies, were you not? Yes, we... Um, my division built nuclear fuel racks for boiling water reactors just like Fukushima. Um, we built the fuel racks for Vermont Yankee, for instance. So, yes, I, I understand the process. You know, the, the, the problem is that it's called the heavy lift. The, the fuel can't be picked up and lifted through air and put down on the back of a pickup and then driven off. The, the fuel is so radioactive that if it becomes airborne, it's, you know, lethal doses within 100 feet and perhaps even more than that. And, of course, if all the fuel were to become unshielded, if all the water were to drain away, uh, it's likely you'd have to evacuate a large portion of the site. So you really don't want that pool to become dry. After it becomes dry, it would also catch fire, and, and that's the worst case for the large population. But should it go dry, there's a period in between when it's so radioactive it creates something called sky shine. The gamma rays from the fuel go up, bounce off air molecules, and come down. The the fancy word is Compton scattering, but it would um, would irradiate the entire site to the point where you just couldn't move people around. Not a place you want to be. So that heavy lift has to be done perfectly. When you put the fuel into these large canisters, you can't drop the canister. Don't drop the canister. Oh, my, my, my. This is Radio EcoShock with former nuclear industry executive and expert witness Arnold Gunderson from Fairwinds.com. Arnie, before we get back to this ultimate threat, it seems to me, of nuclear fuel rods dangling in a very damaged building and two damaged buildings at Fukushima, Japan, I have to say the triple meltdown of the reactors operating at the time of the quake, that's not over either. What is the news about reactor number two, for example? Well, number two has... They were able to get a probe into the containment, not into the reactor, but into the containment. They had thought there would be 30 feet of water. In fact, there was only two feet of water. And you're counting on the water as shielding, and the radiation exposures were um, 7,000 R an hour, which basically would kill you in 10 minutes. So so it's a radiation exposure that that would kill carbon-based life forms, and it's also so high that it'll wipe out robots pretty quickly, too. And that's the bad news is that the the numbers are so high, but that's the best unit. Unit 2 is the one that people can get closest to. Unit 1 and Unit 3 are even worse. So the the question is, how are they ever going to get these cores cleaned up? Because it's coming from the radioactive cores. You know, we're at a point where we have to count on brand new science. There's nothing on the market and nothing foreseeable that's going to um, be able to go into these containments and knock those exposures down. The alternative is to wait 300 years because most of it is coming from cesium, and um, 300 years out, those numbers will drop down. But 
if the alternative is waiting 300 years, somehow I don't think that's very politically palatable. Wow. So we need to invent a technology that hasn't been invented yet. So, Arnie, I think it's time to think the unthinkable. Walk us through what could happen if we wake up one day and the news is just this, that Fukushima Daiichi Reactor 4, the fuel pool, and, and the building have collapsed. Uh, um, there's a Brookhaven National Lab study that actually talks about this. The building doesn't have to collapse, all, or the bottom of the fuel pool just has to break. Now, fortunately, back right after the accident, one of the very first things the uh, Tokyo did, Tokyo Electric did, was put an enormous number of brand new structural supports under the bottom of the pool. But the building is unstable because it's been damaged by its own explosion. And separately, though, it's been damaged by the explosion right next door to Unit 3. So in a severe earthquake, 7 or better, it's likely to break. And whether break means you know, collapse and lay on its side like the Leaning Tower of Pisa or the, um, the pool itself just shatters, I don't know. But uh, in, in either case, the, the outcome is this. The uh, water drains and the uh, fuel gets hot, physically hot. Two things happen. The water was providing shielding as well as cooling, and the um, exposures on site become astronomical. We looked at this back in the States when uh, Dresden, Dresden 1, almost had a fuel pool drain all its water. Uh, it, they forgot to turn the heat on when the unit was shut down and the pipes froze, and uh, it almost caused the entire fuel pool to drain because of these frozen pipes. They estimated that if the Dresden pool had drained, no one could have gotten within uh, three or 400 feet of the thing. And, of course, this pool is much bigger with much more radiation. So the first issue is that you'd have to evacuate a significant part of the site just because the gamma rays coming out of the pool were so great that you couldn't get near it. The second thing happens in perhaps a day or two where the fuel gets hot enough to ignite in air. Zirconium, which is what the fuel is clad with at 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit, wants to absorb oxygen. And if the oxygen is in water, it will suck up the oxygen in water and create hydrogen, which happened in the, in the explosions on 1, 2, and 3. But if the fuel is just exposed to air, it's going to take the oxygen out of air and burn. You know, when it's going to create zirconium oxide, and that's basically a fire. So if the fuel catches fire, uh, you volatilize the cesium, you volatilize the strontium, you volatilize the plutonium, and, uh, you know, a witch's brew of other, uh, of other isotopes, which then go airborne as a um, micron-sized hot particle, and they get breathed in. My advice to our friends in Tokyo is every morning check the tube and make sure that Unit 4 is still standing. And the moment you hear Unit 4 is not still standing, leave. And that's been my advice for, for a year so. Then the, the health consequences, the Brookhaven study says tens of thousands uh, of fatalities from cancers because of the hot particles that are thrown up from the fire. Now, from the selfish point of view of someone living on the west coast of North America, and, and I guess for everyone in the northern hemisphere, it seems to me the key point is whether there is a major explosion that could drive these radioactive materials into the stratosphere where they will spin around the world. And how do you estimate the risk of a major explosion if that Reactor 4 building collapses, for example? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be an explosion. I think it's going to be a fire. But I still would be concerned if I lived on the West Coast. The heat of this fire is extraordinary. So that the particles have a, are buoyant. You know, they're, they're going to be extraordinarily hot, you know, 3,000 degrees. Um, so you're going to have an upward-moving thermal plume that's going to push this thing up five, six, seven miles, um, and then it'll be pushed by the jet stream. The, the hot particles we've already seen on the West Coast probably didn't come from a single event, but were lifted by these the smoky fires that we experienced back in March of last year. This fire would be hotter, so it would uh, you know essentially be this pyre of ionized gases that would would lift the hot particles up high enough uh, to get in the jet stream and hit the West Coast. So. You know, there's a lot of air between the west coast, the west coast of the United States, and the east coast of Japan. So certainly, the Japanese would have to worry more. But you know, it would be appropriate to have you know, monitoring planes looking for the plume and letting people know where the plume was if this event happens. 
you know, I think we all just have to pray that one, that this earthquake doesn't happen until the fuel is out. I think it's pretty clear it will happen, but it doesn't happen until the fuel is out. Or if it does, it's a small enough earthquake that the building doesn't doesn't crack. Yeah, I think we have to make this clear to listeners that this isn't a guaranteed event, that we don't have to totally panic right now, because there is a possibility that we may luck our way through this and not have yet another major, major nuclear event from Fukushima. But there is the possibility it could happen. And so from my point of view, Arnie, we, we've just got to get the Japanese or, or some international body to do as much as we can to make it as safe as we can. Yes, you're absolutely right. As quick as we can. We're in a world where people don't like to be, which is these low probability, high consequence events. Because of the damage to this unit and because of the um, increased seismicity in Japan over the last three or four years, it's no longer low probability, like one in a million. Now, if it's one in a hundred, that's awful. Uh, because the consequences are so severe that even a one in a hundred event would be, uh, you know, mathematically devastating. Yeah, we just we couldn't recover from it in anything in a meaningful human time scale. As you know, Dr. Robert Alvarez, an expert with the Union of Concerned Scientists, has tried again and again to warn us about this that it isn't just a problem in Japan. And you've said this too. The American reactors have built up even more stored fuel rods. Some of them over earthquake fault lines, like in California. All of them requiring nonstop cooling. None of the storage pools that I know of have containment. If there is an accident, can you talk to us about the risk of in, in America? Well, the Mark One pools, and there's 23 in America, don't have a containment above them, and also the Mark Twos, and there's four or five of those. I can't remember. The General Electric Mark Threes, and there's only a few of those, but also the pressurized water reactor pools are much better protected. So the, the real problem is these 23 Mark Ones in the United States, and you know there's two in um, on Taiwan, and there's um, so in America we have left all of our fuel in these spent fuel pools. I was speaking uh, at the Boston Library um, last summer with Dr. Gordon Thompson, and um, he calculated that there's more cesium in the Pilgrim Pool, and this pool is you know 40 miles from downtown uh, Boston than in the 800 bombs that were blown up in the atmospheric testing during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so if that pool were to catch fire, you know, the, the consequences go beyond what, what the Brookhaven lab numbers were. The, the key question is, why are we leaving it there? And the, and the answer, unfortunately, is money. The owners of the plants, the technology is there. You, you um, reconstitute the fuel, put it in a cask, and put it down on the ground, and it's called, and, and it doesn't have to be water cooled, it can be air cooled. Each of those casts costs a couple million bucks, and you need perhaps 30 of them. So we're looking at a hundred million dollar exposure, financial exposure, to the utility that owns the plant. But the consequence is the public exposure is dramatically less. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has consistently bowed to the uh, utility desires to keep the fuel there to save $100 million a reactor. And it's a risk that we shouldn't be taking even before Fukushima. You know, Dr. Alvarez has been saying this now since, I don't know, 1994. So he's been a voice in the, in the wilderness on this for, you know, close to two decades. And it all boils down to money. There's absolutely not a single technical reason why we can't get the fuel out of those pools and into dry storage on the ground. Is there anything that you'd like to add for our listeners as we wrap up? You know, I, I guess two things. One is that this debt of gratitude that I constantly feel toward the uh, perhaps 2,000 uh, men and, and, and a few women that basically saved the world back in March of last year. I'm not talking about the TEPCO executives because they totally botched this, but the men and women at those sites during the first week or two, risk their lives and, and certainly have increased their probability of cancer selflessly. And I think we all owe them a, a debt of gratitude. The, the second thing is that we're dealing with a technology that can destroy a country. Um, Nikolai Gorbachev said in his uh, memoirs that uh, Chernobyl destroyed the Soviet Union, not perestroika. And, of course, we're watching Japan teeter right now. Should that fuel pool catch fire... It will cut Japan in half, you know, from east to west, and uh, 
you can't have a functioning state when you've got a, a ribbon of radioactivity that's you know, 50 miles wide running across the entire country. We really need to think about, is this a technology that, um, that we should be um, doubling down on, or is this a technology we should be developing a strategy to walk away from over time so that we can um, you know, move on to something that's a lot less risky? We have been talking with one of the few nuclear industry experts who will talk. Arnie Gunderson and his wife Maggie are the team at Fairwinds.com. In addition to informing the public, they offer expert testimony in nuclear court cases and government hearings. Be sure and support them at their website, Fair, the letter E, Wins.com. Arnie, thank you again for this update. Thank you for having me, and, and thank you for caring enough to do the update. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock.